for no pepper. You can't properly spice your soup. You got the peanut butter, but no jelly. You gotta put that bread to use. You gotta work with what you got. Don't sweat it until you hit the top. Work with what you got. Don't forget it until you hit the spot. You gotta work with what you got. Don't sweat it until you hit the top. Work with what you got. Don't forget it until you hit the spot. Work with what you got. Welcome to Next Up Accessories, where we connect your next up and vehicle personalization to make you more money and happier customers. What is vehicle personalization? Well, it's a proven process and methodology to present vehicle customization to your customers to put more money in your paycheck, give your customers the car and vehicle that they want, and skyrocket your CSI. For more about vehicle personalization, visit us at insigniagroup.com. If you're an Insignia Group customer, thank you for your business. Remember to check out our blogs. Lots of best practices, tips there, and make sure you subscribe uh, to stay up to date. Also, connect with us on social media. You know I like to talk, but I also like to type. So reach out to us. Let us know what you're thinking. Give us your questions. We'll answer them. We want to thank Side Hustle for the use of their song, Work With What You Got. Very appropriate for 2020, is it not? Uh, find them at SideHustleTheBand.com. They're coming out with a new album next year. Just happen to know that, so look out for that. All right, Cameron, here it is, our final episode. This is the quintessential epi final episode of 2020, uh, the longest year ever for everybody. Ugh, still feels like March, and it's finally come to an end. Hallelujah. To celebrate that we've made it, we have compiled the best of the best from our amazing guests this year. These mind-blowing points, of course, are during a pandemic, and yet the wisdom is timeless and should be carried forward into 2021, which has the promise of some new beginnings. Once again, we thank our guests for their participation. It's only possible with you, and we thank you very much. I also want to take a special moment and thank the Next Up Accessories crew, Cameron, Shay, TJ, Tim, Whitney, Saxada. And whereas we're going to miss Cameron, he's going on to chase his videographer dreams in 2021. We are welcoming to the team Ali Tamira to be our crew and uh, looking forward to another great year ahead. Enjoy these moments and don't forget to comment and ask questions you might have. And we'd love to hear what your favorite moments in 2020 were. We'll see you in 2021. Me as a manager, that's part of what I do is, hey, if something was missed, I need to go make it right. How do I make it right? That's pretty much decided on the fly. Like this morning, going to get that gentleman's uh, uh, tire sensor fixed. Um, it's just what you have to do. You're doing like a 12-hour crazy sort of going and picking up this vehicle. You had mm -hmm. some issues with the vehicle. You mm -hmm. had to get the vehicle somewhat fixed and back on the road. Then, mm -hmm. you know, you're taking it to actually get the vehicle up upgraded according to what the customer wanted. And then you're going to take it back. So uh, bless you for, you know, you're probably going <laughs> to get at 11 o'clock tonight and be yeah. exhausted. So, uh, yeah. but that, but but what you're bringing to light there is that's the sort of ridiculous we call it ridiculous customer service that you've got to do in this segment of yep. the business 
one of the traditional challenges to vehicle personalization is that one time. I yes. can't tell you the number of times that I've gone into a dealership and sat down with the management and we start trying to peel back the onion of why they just can't get it together. And it always happens. Well, you yep. remember that one time, that one time that you did this and one time that that happened and remember that one time and, it, and that's all it takes for a salesperson to go, peace out y'all, I'm, I'm not doing this ever again because this yep. cost me money, it cost me the relationship with my customer because now they're hot and uh, yeah, that's that one time, that's all I got. So we got to get it right. And uh, in the store, getting it right doesn't need doesn't necessarily mean as you're talking about it's perfect. Getting it right just means satisfying the customer, and, and I think you're, you're demonstrating that, and you're you're building your team to demonstrate that, and that's that's very cool. Now, tell me your approach when you've got the the newbie, the green pea that uh, is new to the car business, and they're excited. They've joined your team, and uh, they are absolutely petrified of the first car sale. How do you help them? Because I, I, you know, I get a sense that uh, you are a, a great team member in in your uh, in your sales group. How do you help them to feel comfortable in presenting those things? Are there things that you do to to kind of indoctrinate them the way you? way you were indoctrinated. Yeah. And some of them need different things. I, I find it maybe a little easier than others. Like I told you earlier in, in our discussions, I was a school teacher for 16 years. So having a classroom full of people that don't know what they're doing there might not want to be there and are afraid to be there. I don't want to talk. What are the people going to think of me? What's well, the same thing as a, as a new salesperson or a new sales outfit? What are people going to think of me? They're always worried about what move are they going to make and what effect will that have on how people view them in that in that particular dealership? If I can see that that's something that they're worried about, say, hey, you know, here's what it is that's going on. What do you have coming in? You have somebody coming in to look at a, at a new car, a Crosstrek. How do you know that's the right vehicle? Uh, they need an Outback. How do you know that's the right car? How to do a customer interview? How to show the clients all it is that they could outfit their vehicle with, be it front-end accessories or back-end products and whatnot. A lot of times their goal is just to sell the car. Well, you're missing out on everything. I mean, at the end of the day, if they sit down and, and people want to talk about your performance and they go, this is how many cars you sold, and that's it. I mean, from the income standpoint, if you outfit this vehicle with X amount of dollars more worth of accessories, there's tax paid on that. You have to touch every department as a salesperson when it, when it is that you're trying to get a product out of there. The goal for me would be to show somebody how to touch every department, whether it be the parts. You sell an accessory, helps your parts partner, helps your service partner that's going to put on the accessory. Uh, F&I product uh, in the back end, how it is that they can help outfit the people with a package that works best for them. If everybody can work together, because sometimes salespeople don't always work the best with the people in the back of the house. If you can find out how to touch every department and teach the new guys that come in. Sales managers have a much less stress stressful environment. Okay. So that's going to be our highlight reel from this episode. I've already, I just, Cameron, book it right there. That was amazing. Uh, I've never heard that uh, in all these. So thank you. I just learned something new, a great, a great mentality piece to introduce to a store, especially a salesperson. If, if your car sale doesn't touch every department, you're missing out. That's awesome. Oh my gosh, I'm going to use that. You know, we have traditional stigmas that when we go into a new dealership account or we're, we have a prospect uh, talking to a dealership that, that uh, is considering signing up with us, we have to go through these layers of stigmas. And, and one of the very first stigma is, you know, I, I talked about it, uh, I think, uh, on the last podcast, that one time, you know, we and I won't repeat it, but it's kind of the joke of that one time something happened and, you know, that... I no longer want to sell accessories. And, and so we are, we are probably dealing with a lot of seasoned professionals that are out there because they're the A salespeople, right? So, uh, so they are the seasoned sales professionals. They're in a store that does not offer vehicle personalization. And one of the main stigmas we have to get over is this is going to kill my car deal. That one time it killed my car deal, right? And so talk, I guess talk to our audience about how you individually tackle those reasons why I, I'm just not going to get into this business. I'm just not going to do it as a salesperson. Look, I just don't have the, you know, I don't have the time. I, that one time, all that, all that kind of stuff. What are the traditional barriers that you see for an A salesperson that, that just resists getting into this and doing this? Well, the most basic one is they are absolutely right. If they present <laughs> is at the wrong time, it has the real potential to blow up the sale of the car. 
That's people, right. That's a great. That's a great. Start, way to say that. If they start talking about accessories before the customer has made the choice of the vehicle that they want to purchase and landed on a price that they're going to pay, customer is going to ask them to throw it into the deal. And when they go to their sales manager and say, well, the customer is ready to buy and they're ready to pay this price and we need to throw in these accessories, he's going to have an uphill struggle. The sales manager is not going to just roll over on that right away. They're going to say, well, no, you can't do that. You need to go back and explain to the customer that they're going to have to pay for those accessories. So timing will absolutely blow it. If you don't conclude and arrive on an agreed upon price with the customer for the car before you start exposing the customer the accessories that are available, you will screw it up. And so- So let me just stop you there and just say, uh, that's best practice number one for our podcast. So you've just got to it, there it is. Timing is everything and having the right process in the right timing uh, is key to being successful at this. So what would you consider is your, your best skill? And what I mean by that is, uh, do you feel that you have to be, you know, your number one, do you have to be an expert at vehicle personalization? Do you have to just be a really good salesperson? Do you have to be a good technician? Understand, I mean, rank sort of what you think is the most important skills to have. Um, Cause I, so I'm gonna pour, put some more context. I think a lot of salespeople are nervous about jumping into that kind of business because maybe I'm not an expert at everything that I have to be an expert at to be an accessory manager. Yeah. Do you consider yourself an expert? I guess it would be the first question of that. And then what other skills do you, you know, do you need or put rank up there in terms of being, being successful? Great question. You know, product knowledge, uh, you know, I'll, I'll never say is not important, but, uh, I would rank that, you know, towards the bottom of, of my list. Uh, you know, it's right. the most successful salespeople I've ever seen, you know, knew nothing about, you know, the, the or very little about what they were selling. Uh, it's it's the most important thing for me. And, and what I pride myself on is just caring about the customer, you mm -hmm. know, caring about what it is that they need for their vehicle. You know, if, if I go in and I'm talking to, you know, to, to Mrs. Davis and she just bought a new truck and, you know, her and her husband are super excited about it for their family and for their home and, and that kind of thing, you know, and, and, and I key in on what they're planning on using the vehicle for. I'm not going to try to sell them a, you know, lift kit and wheels and tires and, you know, flames <laughs> on the side of the truck and things like that, because that's not who they are. Uh, and, and if you try to be that kind of person all the time, uh, you're not going to have success. I mean, you know? I did that to my minivan. Is that a problem? <laughs> not at all. No, okay. no, no. Each their own, and and that's that's the other thing. Sometimes you have to get out of your own way and make sure that you know you might not like what what the customer wants to do, but you got to allow them to 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 make their own mistakes. But um, <laughs> but uh, no, it, you know it's it's caring about the customer, caring about what their needs and wants are, uh, and and following through on that. Um, and and that's that's my number one you know job requirement for somebody like me. Um, and then you know after that you know yes it's uh, you know. You do have to have some sales skills, uh, of course. You know, I think somebody somebody coming from a sales background definitely helps. You got to have you know follow up skills and things like that. Uh, those are very very important. But uh, yeah, below that would be where I would rank product knowledge. Uh, yeah. Plenty of times I've sold stuff that I knew nothing about. I think it's a misnomer because I think that folks who are in your role are considered out of the gate. Oh, you must be an expert at, you know, tricking out cars. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what keeps a lot of people. I think it also keeps a lot of salespeople from saying, maybe I can offer vehicle personalization or I can offer accessories. My fear is I don't know everything about it. So I don't want to get nailed with a question that yeah. I can't answer. And I think what's so important about flipping that on its head is, you don't have to know everything. There is a world called the internet that you can find <laughs> anything and everything that you need to know about what you need to sell. I think you're dead on the money in terms of it's about what the customer is looking for. And quite frankly, they're probably going to come in and say, here, this is what I want. Go, go. <laughs> you know, and it's like, all right, well, let me check insignia. It's in there. Yep, great. It's in there. Great. This is here you go. Here's what you wanted. And you didn't have to know anything. You just went off yeah. of what the customer said. So Absolutely. that's great because I think this is the most common question I'm having in today's day and age. I mean, obviously we're, we're sort of on the post curve of the pandemic and the shutdowns. We've got a new normal established out there. We're, we're pushing past it, right? Um, 
what is what could possibly be the reason that you would not get into this business at this point in time or, or, or support this business? I mean, what do you see as sort of the, still the roadblocks in the sales department to in really embracing this as a, you know, you got to do this? It's a great question. Honestly, the, the, the only roadblock that I see is uh, fear. And quite frankly, and, and that fear comes from, you know, lack of understanding and uh, an unwillingness to, uh, to put in the work. Mm. You know, if, if uh, you know, if you're so set in your ways and you've done the same thing for the last 20 plus years, like a lot of dealerships have, you know, they they get stuck in their ways and they're not, they're not willing to make a change. But you know, in this business to be successful, you have to constantly be changing. And right now, you know, with, with the way the car business is, you know, you have to look for every single way to maximize profit on a car deal. And this is without a question, the easiest way to add $500, you know, per copy to, to a car deal, but it's a challenge. It, it takes work as does anything, you know, the, the car business takes work when, when you initially start out, but you know, you put in that work and, and it's, it's really a no brainer once you've, once you've really figured it out. But I think that's really all it comes down to is, is a fear of change and an unwillingness to, to put in the hard work. Yeah. We say all the time, <laughs> yes. Uh, we say all the time, look, it is, uh, it is not rocket science. You know, this is not a rocket science business and it's complicated. And I think that speaks to, you got to put in the work. It is a complicated coordination of, department to department to department, handoff to handoff to handoff. And yeah. certainly you've got to do that well to get the benefits of the CSI and the customer experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got to put in the, the, the work on that. Throw the comment that Jason put up there. There is also a number of real life benefits to the customer. So this is a long one, but let's dissect it because so, this is good. Um, you know, one of the other pieces that, um, that I think is important for salespeople to remember is that they're gonna buy some, your customer is going to buy something somewhere from someone else if you don't offer them. You know, uh, uh, one of the best, one of the, the things that we, we try to use in our best practice uh, sessions is a car dealership, a new car dealership has a hundred percent opportunity to sell accessories on that new car, right? A hundred percent opportunity because the car's there, you know, they're the ones selling it for the first time. So if a customer is going to do something to their car to personalize it for their lifestyle or just for their personality or for the drivability or whatever, you've got a hundred percent opportunity to do it right there, right then during that car sale. If your customer is going to do it anyway, why are you not taking that opportunity to to have that transaction with you, the car salesperson, right? So I think that's another one of the things that uh, when we talk to salespeople, if we just put it uh, inherently, and I'm not a salesperson, I'm an English major, and I pretend to be a salesperson on TV. Uh, so I'm not good at math, but I find that most salespeople are excellent numbers people. And when you throw them something like you have a hundred percent opportunity to do something, it, it, it's triggers some other chemical in their brain where they go, Oh, that makes total sense. Now I'm going to do it. You know, it's like, you know, so, so how are the other, what in other, what ways do you guys use to kind of connect with salespeople? when you're training them or interacting with them or helping them improve, what are some of those best practices, kind of ways that you connect with a salesperson to help them see that? Like, hey, you've got hundred percent of the opportunity. It, it does something, it, it, it triggers something. Do you guys have examples where you use similar tactics? I like the key phrase, obligation. Mm, okay, explain. Riff, on, riff on obligation. You have an obligation to your customer to service them properly, by letting them know that they can have a free extended warranty on their accessories, right? Um, because they'll get the same bumper to bumper warranty on the accessories they get on the car if it's purchased, if the accessories are purchased with the car, literally yeah. on the 
purchase order. So if you're not, don't tell the customer that you're doing them a disservice. And likewise, you're obligated to let them know that the least expensive way they could possibly buy accessories is to roll them into their column. Mm -hmm. There is no credit card that comes close to the rate that they're going to get on their new car loan. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're doing your customer a disservice to not introduce it to them. And as long as this is a soft presentation and you look at it that way, that you're, you know, it's my obligation, Mr. Customer, to let you know that you can get a three-year warranty if you buy your accessories today and that we probably can make it very affordable for you by rolling it into the payments. The other obligation is an obligation to the people that you work with. Um, if you just sell a car and you don't sell accessories, then you're not feeding your parts department and you're not feeding your service department. And you, I, I tell salespeople, you have an obligation to help out your teammates. And that's an additional reason on top of everything else to present accessories to your customers. And that puts it in a very different perspective than the simple, you get to make more money. Yes. But right. back to the A salespeople, I mean, the difference between the A salespeople, the cream of the crop and the rest of them is that they are salespeople. They happen to be selling cars but they are salespeople and they understand the opportunity to make extra money when you put it in perspective for them. That way. Right. I and love then, what yeah. you did there with obligation. You used it in such a, com a complex way, meaning it's their obligation. It, and now it becomes a word track you can use with your customer and it's their obligation to, to their other cohorts and their other uh, co-employees in their other departments. That's awesome. I, I love that. So hear that out there, salespeople, you're obligated to sell accessories. Jimmy, do you have uh, uh, something like that? Well, so, so I kind of, I don't know if I'm going backwards or not, but um, really, you know, the sales individual sales team member needs to be sure that you're quote unquote investigating and interviewing every person that you're selling a vehicle to. And you need to make sure what they're driving in with. I mean, are they driving in with a, you know, a Jeep lifted with uh, big wheels and tires, roof rack, running boards. Like what, what, are, what are they driving in with? I mean, what mm -hmm. is their style? You know, when you're talking to the uh, person you're selling the vehicle to, I mean, what did they do last weekend? Did they take a big bike ride with their kids? Do their kids go surfing? Do they go surfing? Like, you know, find out what they do for fun and find out what they drove in with. Cause it's very likely they're going to need those accessories for, what either they drove in on or what they do for fun uh, and, and use that. Yeah. And use that and find out what their problems are with the vehicle they have now and how you could be a, create a solution for that. Jeff, uh, you have been a, uh, uh, um, you've been a finance manager for a number of years. Yeah. Talk to us about that moment where you suddenly said, Oh, okay. Okay. Accessories isn't so bad. Because I know that when you first joined the business, that's not what you were told. Tell me about that time that you, you know, that time. Everybody's got that story. Remember that time? Yeah. So I, I kind of had a force on me. I went to go work for a store that had a very established accessory process. Um, oh, nice. You know, very, yeah. So, you know, seeing what you're talking about, best practices, right? They sell the car, go through the accessories with the customer while the deal's getting loaded and I'm doing everything else. So when I first got there, you know, my mindset was traditional. I've been in the business a while, looked at it, and I'm like, yeah, I know this is going to kill me. You know, these people, the, the payments aren't going to be accurate. It, you know, these people are, are moving themselves, to, you know, $30, $40 a month. That's service contract money. You know, that's, that's where it's coming from. I quickly discovered that it, it doesn't hurt at all. In fact, I feel like it helps. I feel like people who, a lot of the same customers who are willing to purchase accessories and go through that, will purchase F and I products as well because they're personalizing your vehicle and it makes it more yours. And to be pretty honest, F and I is mostly about fear of loss and protecting your vehicle. So when you've personalized your vehicle more, guess what? You want to protect it more too. Um, yes. So it's that it, it definitely helps. And you know, I, I feel like the accessory sales process is a good place to even introduce some F and I products, especially when it comes to like interior exterior protection. I've seen a lot of dealers do a really good job of that as well. So I, I, it can go hand in hand. It doesn't hurt one another at all. If anything, you can feed off of it and say, okay, you know, you did this or you added all these accessories. I know you were looking at this payment before you can move terms. You can work flexibility with the customer. It gives you the option 
to sit with the customer, go through everything they added, try and help them out to make it maybe a little bit more affordable with the accessories they wanted, and then present you know all the things that can help protect them and their investment. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, perfect. Highlight reel number two. Man, we're on a roll, gentlemen. We're killing it. When I was out west uh, working at a lot of the Ford dealers there, I actually would build a vehicle for the showroom floor that my salespeople could work off of. You know, I, I picked an F-150, the most popular vehicle we had. Uh, I'm working with my sales manager on that on an Atlas right now, but nice. something that's new to the norm, you know, so it's they're a little hesitant, but I would actually build the F-150 so you can use this idea. Uh, each corner was different. Okay, well, what I mean is, is like the right rear corner, it would have a six inch lift, nice 37 inch tall tire on a 22 inch wheel. The left front corner would be a 37 inch tall tire on a 20 inch wheel. That corner would have a fender flare on it where the right rear wouldn't. The right front would be stock height, but I'd have like a, um, a race ramps block underneath it. So the whole truck would sit level, bed liner in the back, uh, uh, a tonneau cover of some capacity from some brand. The left rear corner would be something totally different. Maybe a stock wheel with just a tire on it. Do you ever have the uh, the opportunity to actually have somebody come in and go, man, I want that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm driving out of that. I'm driving out of here with that today. You would be surprised how many people would humorously say that, but they would want the truck I have on the showroom floor. Yeah. And they ask, can you make the whole truck like this corner? Right. And they sell themselves. We'll say specific to vehicle personalization and the process that we're you know here to talk about what have you done to continue to make sure you're offering customization to those car buyers um, and maximizing not only their enjoyment of the vehicle and making sure that they know what they can do with the vehicle um, and also the revenue i mean you know when you go from selling 300 a month to selling maybe 30 to 100 a month you know obviously there's a giant drop in revenue maximizing um, each vehicle sale. What have you guys done to make sure that that's, that's possible? Well, I guess, you know, we always try to maximize every opportunity that we always get, no matter if it's bad times or good times, but especially now, you know, we've, we've certainly put a focus on, on accessories and backend options and that type of thing where we, we put our insignia on our website uh, and that's where we normally put all of our online orders and everything like that through. So, you know, we're, we're already used to using the online version of that. Um, and we require that on every single deal, at least, you know, a, a decline at worst case scenario, but everything is required to have that. What we've been doing is actually making recommendations to the customer based off of what, what we've learned throughout our whole process for one, you know, based on their trade and that type of thing. You know, if they already have a hitch on, on their vehicle, they probably need a new hitch on the new vehicle, that type of thing. But we, we try to take opportunities to make recommendations for certain specific customer recommended accessories, similar to, you know, making a, a recommendation list, body side moldings, door edge guards, those types of things. But uh, we, we put a big emphasis on protecting investments at this point. And at our dealership, with volume down, this is a great time to not only add extra revenue buckets, because for a lower volume, you can add more to each deal with accessories, but it's also a time to kind of sharpen our skills. And we've encouraged all the salespeople, while it's slow, this is a time to become a master and expert at vehicle customization. So right. all the while through the process, you talk to customers, tell me about your current vehicle. If they have it, you can, like you said, Peter, you can look at the hitch. You can see if they've had mud guards, those type of a things. Do they have step bars on their forerunner that they're trading in? Those are all things they're going to expect. You can't go back if you have it on your current vehicle. So it's, it's a perfect time to allow customers to customize it, to make it their own. Because as we all know, the cars on the lot, that's the foundation, that's the shell. That may not be the vision that customers have in their mind. So it's really a matter of during the qualifying process, Find out what's important to them. What is their ideal vehicle? What will make them 100% happy? And in these times, we, we're so blessed and humbled to have these customers who come in now. We, we want them bending over backward, telling about how great the experience was. And customization is a huge part of that. <laughs> hey, 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 Dave, this is, this is one thing I wanted to just comment on real quick, if you don't mind. So Yeah, please. You know, Kevin, let me ask you a quick question. You were saying that you're not sure. getting every turnover from sales. If you had to take a guess and say the percentage of turnover you're getting from sales, how much would you say you get? 
Uh, not as much as I'd like, but if I had to put a percentage on it, I'd say probably 30 to 35 percent. Mm. Okay. One, one best practice I had, which I don't know who's listening to the podcast as well, but in finance, we have a lot of the same problem. People who are paying cash, uh, we don't get to see them beforehand before they go get a check. Uh, people who leave the showroom and then they're just coming back to take delivery, we don't get the FaceTime. One of the things um, uh, an F&I trainer who I actually learned from, who I respect very much, who's uh, part of F&I and Showroom Magazine, a guy named George Angus, mm -hmm. uh, he had published an, an article on that. And what he said is, look, you can go to the dealer and stomp your feet and scream and yell and I'm not getting the customers and, you know, there's, nothing's going to happen. But what you can do is if you take your average ticket, whether it be in finance per unit or accessory or whatever it is, and multiply that by the amount of people that you're missing that you're not seeing mm -hmm. and show him what that number is annualized and just nice. put it in front of his face and just say, look, I'm not here to complain. I'm just telling you right now, you're missing out on $750,000 a year. And immediately go, what do you mean? What do you mean I'm missing out on $750,000 a year? <laughs> well, look, I'm not getting the turnover from sales. Here's the amount of people that I'm missing a month. Add my average amount that I sell on a ticket times 12 months. If sure. I saw those people and I average this amount of money over that period, that's the income potential that you're losing. Yeah, and no, I agree, people, yeah. And immediately, I got to tell you, anytime I've ever done that, I told somebody to do it. The dealer is on the phone with the GSM or general manager within five seconds. <laughs> you need to make sure that he's getting all the turnover, uh, making sure that he's getting the opportunity because you cost him money. Yeah, I think the, the important factor that I want to highlight for our audience is that that ultimately means that vehicle personalization, accessories, customization to the customer is really what we're talking about is really part of the product you are selling. So it's not an afterthought. It's not something that, you know, we'll try to figure it out later. It's really designed to be from the very uh, beginnings of the vehicle all the way through manufacturing and into the showroom. Well, now it's really a part of that vehicle and it's been designed to be a part of that vehicle. And I think that's one of the points that uh, we try to highlight in our consulting is look, you know, the, the manufacturer is uh, is building the ability for you to customize this vehicle and building a, a ability to customize the vehicle for your customer and allowing your customer, if I'm talking to a, a, a salesperson. So it it's not an after, yeah, we'll just do it if we if we think about it. You know, it's really part of the whole process. So let's use that to to um, you know to to talk about the defender, which uh, has gotten a, a tremendous amount of press and and good reviews. Um, talk about how uh, that was to bring that vehicle back uh, from sort of the archives. Uh, see, people seem to really enjoy the fact when you you bring a nameplate back from from history and say, "Yep, yeah, this is the new defender." Uh, we're seeing that around other other places. So, how was that? unbelievably exciting um it's uh, probably one of the most difficult things around because it was such a long development process um and we couldn't talk about it for years <laughs> <laughs> um and, and there was a lot to want to talk about um so, yeah. so i think from that end it was it was it was a rather painful number of years um <laughs> but i think at the end of the day it was kind of tremendously exciting um and that that notion of really at least for for north america reviving a nameplate that hadn't existed for 23 plus years here um to, to think about it in that context yeah um which is also the the challenge of it being that it's a vehicle with a tremendous number of fans out there um so how do you live up to and exceed the expectations of all of those fans um so it, that that was kind of another big difficulty in, in trying to do it and get it right um and and is what i think probably one of the, those key reasons on why it took the amount of time that it did from when we first started showing defender concepts early on in, in this decade um but i think it, obviously the end result is ex exceptionally exciting um in, in terms of especially how it i think for me at least lives up to and the defender name um at the end of the day between the design the overall capability, especially off-roading, but then thoroughly modernizing that. So you actually have an off-roader you want to drive on the road and the highway. Um, <laughs> and it's like, and, and a fully digital um, 
off-roader as well in terms of all of the integration with um, what we have from an infotainment perspective, um, what the, all the capabilities with software over the air, um, Spotify in the car, still all the CarPlay, Android Auto, wireless charging, on and on and on, um, and all the driver assistance systems and safety systems. So it was that side of, and kind of I'll let everyone be the judge of it, but for us it was how do you take the Defender, rethink it for this decade, mm -hmm. and then just amplify it and, and make it even better in every way possible. Um, so it was, it was an exciting challenge. So uh, the Defender also had a pretty good lineup, probably your most extensive lineup for accessories. So oh, talk, yeah. talk about the, the thinking behind that. What, what was the thinking behind that? Yeah, we're, we're headed towards 170 or so accessories on it. Right. Um, and then the thinking of it was, and this kind of goes to the history of Defender too, where the product over the decades meant so many different things to so many different people. Mm. So if you think about it, it was a tool for kind of post-war era. It was a mm -hmm. tool for farmers. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, it was used all around Hollywood and by the royal family um, <laughs> as a form of transportation. Um, so when you look at kind of that spectrum of uses and all the different things Defender did for people and all the different things that it meant for them, it means that you have to have a, a huge amount of variation and capability for it. And that was kind of the concept with the accessory strategy too, is whether it's someone that wants it to, to really use it as a more utilitarian tool, having things available for them to help with kind of just carrying stuff um, or, mm -hmm. or having that flexibility to just wash things out and, and do things around, um, whether it be the farm or, or out on the, on the ranch or wherever else. Um, and then the flip side of it is anyone that's using it more for call it family purposes, how do we have the things available that actually help the family use the vehicle um, and, and kind of make it more convenient in their day-to-day -day lives? Um, and that was, so that was really kind of when you look at the accessory offering, it's kind of having that breadth of, hey, I'm going to the jungle and I need the things to help me get through it. Or I'm going to um, the, the school line and I need the help to, to kind of make sure I've got all the things that the kids want for um, getting there and, and then any of their activities that they have afterwards. <laughs> Very much so. And so it probably plays into the packages that Jaguar Land Rover came out with for, uh, for the Defender. So there was the, uh, the Explorer, the Adventure, the Country, and the Urban. So I think, you know, you're sort of hitting on that spectrum. Um, what, from a factory perspective, what is the reasoning for doing packages like this? Um, really, really make things a little easier um, for for consumers, um, salespeople, um, the the people um, controlling the, the inventory at the at the dealer, and, and even mm -hmm. through our pipeline as well. Um, so the end, I, the end purpose really is for the consumer. If they if they've got certain things that they do or that they know that their vehicle equipped for, these were kind of turnkey um, solutions for them, so that it's kind of like right out right out of the gate you've got the vehicle ready for some of the, the core things that you might want to be doing um, obviously all those things are still available a la carte and and for people to install throughout their life with the vehicle too um, but that was really the key idea was that day you take delivery kind of tick this box and, and you're ready to go on on that adventure you want what however extreme it might be right and then a great strategy there for um your showroom the, the actual showroom itself. I mean, uh, you could do one or two of those packages on, you know, your your display defender and uh, make it stand out uh, because you've got that package on it. Uh, make it something that's different than the rest of your inventory. So um, I think those are also, you know, really good ways, uh, sort of speaking out there to the audience, really good ways to use these packages in order, in, in any packages really for from any OEMs to differentiate vehicles and differentiate inventory. So. Yeah, and, and I think it's um, for a lot of people. It's how do you make something tangible, um, mm -hmm. right? Versus um, looking at it in a catalog or, or online, um, being able to actually see, touch, um, understand, kind of how it functions um, becomes so critical. And I think that's kind of where we've often have been having those discussions with with our our partners out there. 
um, how do you actually put more of that in front of people um, as it really kind of then helps make it click for them that, yeah, that's something they need. Um, and even more so kind of motivating and, and you've probably seen at some of our events, actually having them, all, all the vehicles with actually bikes, kayaks, skis, Absolutely. The, the lifestyle stuff in, in the trunk, any of the gear in the trunk as well. I again to put more context around it for people where it's kind of like, hey, I bike. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I think that's that key bit is kind of really helping connect the vehicle to people's lives more. You know, it's a good time to mention, you know, so about this being a professional salesperson that works by appointment only, you're right. So we have them build different companies. You got, we have your up company, your referral company. Well, one of the companies we have them build is their aftermarket company. And this is going back 29 years. You got to have your aftermarket company built. You know, you got to have your projections on, on um, sales, on profit, on commissions, on penetration per deal. And in the old days, there was a, there was a best practice step of after the deal's closed, walking them to a, a room that had tires on the wall and wheels and bumpers and lights and stereos and everything hanging around. And, and they would immerse themselves in this room with all these accessories and you know, hey, pick something out. The speed and, shop. Yeah. Yeah. You know, before they went to F and I. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so we would train them. We would train them in the, in the training, hard ads, soft ads, what the bank link, the banks will uh, lend extra for what they want. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they could they could do that properly and not mess up the structure of a deal because you can't interrupt cash flow. That's the number one thing they learn. This is a business, and you got to manage that cash flow for the dealership. That's your number one of your number one objectives, other than make sure everybody leaves happy. Is you got to get that thing, those contracts funded fast. You can't mess up the structure, but you got to get it maximized. Right. And there's almost always room for accessories in a monthly payment without cash. But then think about everybody leaving. To go put those accessories on their credit card, they're right. going to finance it on their credit card, so they can do that right here. Right. And, right. And knowing whether I need to take this money on a credit card or I can put it in the deal before you walk into that accessory department, or now before they walk into your virtual your virtual accessory department, which is even better, uh, is is a, like an example of a critical piece of training and knowledge they need that they probably won't get from the dealership. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and you touch on something that uh, I'd like to kind of expand on this whole idea of businesses within the business. Um, I've said uh, a number of times publicly that if I were a salesperson and the dealership that I work for did not support vehicle personalization as a broad uh, business model within their, their business, I wouldn't care. Right. Because what I would do, I would care, but I wouldn't care because what I would do is I'd go and I'd make my contract, my my business plan with my parts manager. And yeah, I'd go right around my sales manager. And guess what? He'll probably chew me out the first and second and third time that I do this. But the fourth time I put a thousand dollars worth of additional accessories on a vehicle, he's going to shut up. My parts manager is going to back me up. Service manager is going to install them. I, I, he asked for them. I, she asked for them. I, I, don't know, I don't know what to tell you. I, I just feel like sometimes salespeople feel like they're, they're trapped. They're trapped in their own sales department. And there's two other departments out there who are desperate to try to work with them to get them to offer accessories and, and additional um, add-ons to their vehicle, to their car sales, because they know it's going to grow their business. So uh, I don't know how you feel about that. I mean, I, it'd be kind of fun to lead that as a course in your college management, the David Stringer go around your manager, you know, theory, but that probably wouldn't float too well too long. <laughs> well, you got, you got to have respect, right? You want your manager working for you, helping you by you serving, helping them, elevating them in the position, showing them respect, um, making their job easier, not harder. And I got to tell you, the, 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 I believe the issue a lot of managers face is they don't know where they're at in that deal. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know. Gosh, I mean, I got this deal. There's a lot of profit in this deal. I got this deal pretty maxed out. If I put another thousand bucks in here, I might be out of whack. I might not get a fund. Don't mess with it. Just get it to F and I. Don't mess with it. And let's just get this deal on the road. And that comes from lack of knowledge. Yeah. And there is no formal training on the planet for automotive loan underwriting other than this one hmm. interesting 
And so if they didn't come here, how did, you know, unless they spent the time and learned it, and they were an excellent FI manager, and they were even more importantly, though, an excellent FI director, and they understood loan underwriting, deal yeah. structuring, credit bureau analysis. And they understood all of that, not at the dealership level, but at the lending level. So they can work at the lender. They can walk right in, sit in a chair, and underwrite loans because we're a lending school. Remember, I told you I went to work for my dad. It was he owned a finance company, and that's yeah. where the college was born. It's from lending. So we and taught everybody lending. Lending opens the door for everything. Hmm. Dealership uses it to buy his property and to buy his his facility in most cases. He finances a portion of that. A lot of flooring on new cars, maybe sometimes used if they're short on cash. Lending is critical to building your business within the business, understanding how that works for them, how that's going to work for you. And then when you get down into the deal structuring, you could screw up a deal if you don't put the recessories in the right place or, or don't collect for them right. But you can also, like you said, become the hero. And you can become the hero 100% of the time. You'll always, like you said, get his support. Yeah. If you're doing it intelligently, and you can. You can know exactly what you should do with all the dollars, whether you collect a credit card for them, whether you're going to put it in the finance. And a lot of times our salespeople do know more about lending than their managers, but they learn how to use that information to serve and to um, do their job and not second guess or, or, or some of the things that would not come off very well. <laughs> you mean the David Stringer method? All right, that's it. The best of the best from 2020. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we look forward to more podcasts in 2021. We're going to have a whole lineup of guests and uh, we're going to keep going in terms of vehicle personalization and helping you make more money, happier customers, skyrocket that CSI. This is Next Up Accessories. I'm David Stringer. I'll see you in 2021. Thanks so much.